Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I know I'm the only person standing between you and lunch, so I'll try and keep this short and reasonably sweet. Um, so I'm going to look at a bit of history lesson around space sustainability, um, looking back to two, from 2000, what, what's been happening and the lessons learned since then. I chose 2000, A, it's a round number, but B, it's also the year I started at Inmarsat, and the at Inmarsat became head of satellite operations and then of the space segment roadmap, and my focus on space sustainability has been going now for 15 years, in fact, a bit longer. So this is a topic that's close to my heart. I want to share a couple of sort of observations that I've seen during that time and maybe some things we can take forward. So I've got one chart, but quite a few animations. So this is testing my PowerPoint skills to the max. So see if it works. So I've got a chart here developing some of the key activities that happened in the last 24 years. And at the bottom, unsurprisingly, is a, a plot of the number of spacecraft launched per year. The fact you can see the scale is quite big is it doesn't take a rocket scientist to tell you what's going to happen. You, already, you know what's coming, but let's put a context around, around that. So from an SSA perspective, uh, at, the, uh, at the turn of the millennium, essentially the best practice, what there was out there, was the public catalogue as published by the US DOD. They provided a set of two line elements, and they still do today. A set of observations, uh, these are individual state vectors for individual spacecraft. This is all we had for the first 10 years, really about what's up in space. And a couple of observations around that. It's coming from a national security system. That's fair enough. It has a very low level of transparency. You don't know where the data came from. You don't know when the observations were made. You don't know how accurate the data is. And one of the key observations that we found is that this is useful data, but it's not of the quality required for safety of flight. You can't use this on a day-to-day -day basis to be able to make judgments about what to do with spacecraft in orbit. And really importantly, it's where the spacecraft was. You can project it forward using Newtonian mechanics and you can make a guess where or you can project where it's gonna be in the forward in the future. But if you make a maneuver on the spacecraft, they got no way of knowing. If I'm gonna move in an hour's time, in two hours' time, this data is wrong. And that's why it's fundamentally not good for safety of flight. But it was all that we had. There were two events uh, that occurred which really woke everyone up to the issue of space sustainability. The first was, the in 2007, uh, the Chinese launched an anti-satellite weapon against one of their defunct weather satellites. That produced a large amount of debris. A lot of it we are still li living today. So we focus on things like spacecraft reliability and propulsion and stuff like that, but there's events that can happen out there which are completely outside the scope of the actual individual spacecraft design criteria. And to that, you can add solar activity. You could add cyber attacks. You could add, I know earlier this year, there's talk about someone putting a nuclear device in space and creating an EMP pulse. These are things which can affect stuff in space independent upon how you design your spacecraft. So that these sort of events are out there and need to be thought about more holistically when we look at aggregate risk. And the second one most people know about is the Iridium Cosmos collision in 2009. So this put to bed the myth that space is big. Okay, space is big, but things move very fast and this is a probabilistic game. This collision happened between an active satellite and a defunct satellite. This produced 2,000 bits of debris, of which the vast majority is still in orbit today. So this shows you that even with the very low level of satellites being launched into orbit back at that time, the risk was real, and it's not something we can just ignore and say space is big and we don't have to worry about it. So shortly after um, that Iridium Cosmos collision, we had a, a conference about space sustainability in London. Um, back in the day, it was a bit geeky. I think we've probably filled the first two rows of these tables here with the people who attended, and only astrodynamicists and folks like that who can do the, the hard sums. Um, space sustainability now is such a hot topic. Now we can do two rows of a Taylor Swift concert. But we, after this conference, we went to the pub, and we said, look, this Iridium, the Iridium Cosmos collision is a real wake-up call for us. We know this data coming from the US Department of Defense isn't fit for purpose for what we need it to do. We know where our satellites are going to be in the future. So could we come together and actually share our data, even though we're competitors, can we share our data for the protection of space 
as a, as a global commons? And the obvious answer is yes. My comment, this is not this is not super hard. So we set up a not-for-profit organization called the Space Data Association, which has been running since 2010. I was its chairman for about three years, um, where basically we went around all the operators and said, look, pay a token amount of money. We'll, we'll design a system which ingests both our operator data with all the things like maneuvers in the future, along with the public catalog, and we'll try and come up with a best of breed solution to, uh, to manage risk. And that was, that was pretty successful. And it's still running today. Back in the day, it was very geo-focused. The money is in geo. Now the risk is in Leo. Um, ESA also, recognition for ESA standing up their uh, debris office back in 2009 as well at this time. Then I'll put into, so we have the, the sort of the government data, through to the operator data, through to the commercial data. And I'll put just a couple of examples out here. There's many, many companies out there doing space situational awareness commercially. So I'm, I'm not picking these two out um, at, at sort of they're more at random than anything else. So we started getting videos of what's happening in geostationary, live videos. And you want the geo environment looks benign, but it's not. We're seeing spacecraft disintegrate. We're seeing bits flying off. We're seeing fuel tanks leak all their fuel out. It was actually a far more dynamic environment, and things were happening than far more uh, available in the public domain. But you just need a telescope, and it's all up there. The second example here is Leo Labs. So they, they're designing the radars that are typically like they're used in the space surveillance network. And if you if you're on X or Twitter and you follow them, every couple of months or so you'll get a notification saying there's going to be a potential collision tomorrow, probability 20%. And there've been a couple of these, and they've both been misses. Or, but one day at 20% probability, it won't take too long before there's another collision that happens. So yeah, we moved to the, uh, the commercial data. And you can see the uptick in the number of spacecraft in orbit. That's primarily CubeSats being launched. And then we get to where we are at the moment. So we know what's happened since 2019. A huge increase in the number of spacecraft, uh, driven primarily um, by Starlink, but uh, one way deployed during that, that era as well. So we've almost had two orders of magnitude more spacecraft in orbit or being launched per year now than we did a decade ago. And, but we still have the same regulatory environment. We, we haven't really changed much about how we manage space, even though the problem or the, the, the complexity of the issue has got far higher. So I think as of today, there's about 9,400 active spacecraft. It changes like every day or so when uh, a new Starlink launches. Um, around 3.4 million kilograms of mass and around 80,000 square meters of surface area. So that's quite a lot of stuff up in space. Uh, also mentioned to ESA's work on zero debris, really uh, uh, an important initiative. Um, and looking forward, if I pick up the EuroConsult forecast, and you plot this, this isn't changing any time soon. In fact, it, and remember, this isn't the total number of spacecraft in orbit. This is just how many are added each year. Um, we've, we've got things like Kuiper uh, coming along in the coming years. Uh, China has got two big constellations planned. Uh, I just put uh, G60 here, but uh, Gil Wang is a 11,000 satellite constellation that's planned to go up in the coming years. So this problem is then going to get more complex. And we have lots of initiatives around active debris removal, manufacturing in space, which in themselves are really interesting technologies but we should not think about them as solving the problem. These are not, this is not a golden bullet that you can solve space sustainability because you can remove a spacecraft with another spacecraft. So from a, from a space traffic management perspective, um, what, we're, what we're essentially doing at the moment is managing systems in isolation. Either you're managing a satellite, you make sure it's reliable, you make sure you can move it, you make sure you can track it, or you, ma or you manage a constellation. But that, that's all laudable, but space is actually far more complex than that. Space is about a system of systems. Just going back to that Iridium Cosmos collision, that was one system interacting with another system. So no matter how reliable that Iridium satellite was, it wasn't going to help it when, it, when, when that collision happened. So actually modeling space is very important and, and uh, call out to folks at ESA, MIT, who are running some of these very complex Monte Carlo simulations to actually really work out what's happening in space. 
what are the key variables that you can change to have influence in terms of sustainability? Do you have a lower cross-sectional area? Do you have lower mass? Do you go into a certain orbit? Do you have a certain number of satellites? These are fundamentally important questions about how we design our future space systems. At the moment, we don't really do that. At the moment, we have a nice design. We look at it in isolation. We launch it and deploy it. But that is not really a scientific way of man managing space in the future. So looking forward, every chart these days has to have, have, have an AI block in it, so I put one on here. But uh, looking forward, we really need to get for, uh, start man looking at space far more as this system of systems aspects. Regu we have a global commons in space. It's finite. It's being taken, resources are being used up. Um, we know from a, uh, from a, uh, a history of humanity that when you have a global commons, and there's no management of that global commons, it ends really badly. So regulation, back to the previous panel, is super important. Effective regulation is important. And we need regulators who understand the issue, not just look at a satellite in isolation, but understand space more holistically. And we're looking at some of the techniques that have been applied, especially to things like uh, laser generation weather forecasting, it used to all be done by Monte Carlo simulations. They've now moved to generative AI. That is a technology that may be allowing you to be able to tackle the system systems issues at a regulator level. Not every regulator is going to have a supercomputer in their basement to run Monte Carlo simulations and tweak the variable here and there. But maybe right, that's a, the Monte Carlo simulations are the state of the art at the moment, and we should be using them to inform our decisions now. Absolutely. They are the best we have. Looking forward, I think there's a world where we can combine these sort of analytical type of models along with a generative AI type of techniques to be able to help inform us about what is sensible in the future. Otherwise, I fear that uh, in 10 years' time we'll be coming around and there can be far more examples of that Iridium Cosmos collision. Now the numbers are up at adding three, 4,000 spacecraft per year. Okay, lunch. <laughs>